Okay, so the next question is, what programming tools do you use day to day? So I think we actually use a lot of the same tools, but we're Vim users. Yeah, Vim users. Tmux. Use Tmux. I don't use Tmux. No, Tmux. I use Tmux a lot. Uh, I use ZSH these days with Presto. I switched from my ZSH because I started to get swag requests, and I was what if getting it's really fired. cool? It could be. I don't what feel like cool adware tricks? in my shell is a good thing. Mm. You know, this really bothers me about the post install message in Ruby Gems. I've noticed people have been starting like spamming them. Like now, I'm told to have a party when I install HTTP party, and donate to charity. Donate also. to charity. Yeah, so I feel I like feel that like, feature is very abused. I feel like the after install message is for like compatibility warnings, not for arbitrary messages. Yes. yes. So yeah, adware seems bad. Uh, so I switched to Presto. Uh, I don't really use Macrim that much. Uh, I got out of the habit when I was Chromebooking, mm. and now I just kind of stick with it. So the thing that always bothered me about uh, about Tmux is I found it really difficult to copy and paste stuff. Like if I wanted mm. to copy something into a, into a text editor or into a Stack Overflow, for example, like a little field. So I have gotten used to having a workflow of like piping things into the gist command, which will mm. basically. Oh, so in Vim you can like select text and then pipe it into an arbitrary terminal, yes. and it gets in a standard in. Yes, confirm. Mm. So, so you probably just do pb copy uh, if you want. If I want so to copy I, it, I'm usually so actually my workflow these days is that I have a I have 16 gigabytes of RAM in my MacBook and I just keep a running Linux distribution because I find <laughs> I fi <laughs> what and I so I find <laughs> app get to be a much That's better. That's not true, is it? Yes. <laughs> so I find app get to be a way better <laughs> totally package accurate. manager than Homebrew, <laughs> <laughs> and so I. <laughs> Plus, when I upgrade to oh. Mavericks and Yosemite, I don't have to worry about that. So anyway, so pronounce Yosemite. Yosemite. So I basically have a VM that I SSH into, and I use regular Vim, and I pipe into Gist and stuff. Like. You can pipe into PV Copy. It would work on all the time. It seems cool. We also do a lot of pairing on the iMac still. Ah, yes. I actually like the pairing setup that we have has ended up working very well. Yes, for I us. have not felt like I need to change it at all. So That's just fun. for the viewers at home. We have a setup whereby we have uh, two desks set up at kind of an angle where the corner of one touches the corner of the other, kind of like this. And then we've got an iMac and then a another iMac. An, an, uh, display. A 27 inch yeah. display. The, the key thing is that we can see each other, give each right. other high fives, yeah. but we have our own space. We're yeah. looking at our own computers with our own yeah. keyboard and mouse. Well, I, think, I use a mouse, you use a trackpad. Or the opposite, use a mouse, I use a trackpad. Right. And I think a lot of the pairing setups I see are. Uh, display and then I have a keyboard and mouse and then you have a keyboard and mouse or there's like one keyboard and we share depending on who's driving but uh, to me sitting side by side with someone really hampers communication yes so the fact that we can just both swivel maybe five or ten degrees and look at each other in the eye and have a conversation is really important yeah so, I feel like we've been pairing for or I've been pairing now for like a lot of years like yeah. seven years and I haven't Whenever I pair with like the more traditional setups, I run, I run out of patience yes. for it very quickly, and this setup a lot like it's pretty relaxed. Yeah. You can have your own space, like yeah. you said. You don't feel like like you're a long term grill. space. Yeah. The person you're pairing with didn't brush their teeth that morning. You don't have to be like, hey, do you want to stick a gum? I'm also not that into promiscuous pairing, but that's a whole other. I mean, I yeah. pair with like Tom and Tim and and, yeah. and I'm um, Tim. I'm, I'm Tom. Tom and Tim and Carl, and Carl a lot, yeah. and um, I definitely like pairing with them for different topics, but it's not like. Mostly it's like I pair with Carl when I'm working on Rust stuff, I pair with Tom when I'm working on Ember stuff, and having like a longer term relationship I think is good. So this is a little bit off topic, but what do you look for in like a pairing partner? If you're not promiscuous, you're a little bit more uh, <laughs> so on pair with. Honestly, it's mostly about <laughs> finding people that balance out uh, like complementary. So I definitely can both get way in the weeds and also not in the weeds enough and having people that make sure that, like I think the, real value in pairing is you can be right 95% of the time, but if 5% of the time you go off into crazy land yeah. and you don't have anybody to pull you back, you can lose all the productivity games, right? So ha like I find pairing to be most productive when there's people that are countering uh, pathologies that I have. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think the thing for me is um, I find it's really useful to kind of change the level of detail that you're operating at. Like I think when we pair, we tend to go we start at a high level and we kind of map out where we're going. Then we'll drill into the details. But I think I think we do a pretty good job of saying, okay, well, we've been working on this for about an hour. Let's pull back. And a lot of times it's not actually pairing. We'll go for a walk. Yep. We'll go for a walk for like 10 blocks, maybe more. Say, you know, okay, where are we at? Where do we land here? 
And so for me, being able to kind of zoom in and out on level of detail is really important. Whereas I've, I've paired with people before where they are either frustratingly high level and we can never actually get down into the details or they're so detail oriented that you, like, you really lose the plot in terms of where yeah. you're going. Yeah, so I, I think it's important that after you, you're in the weeds for a little while, as you said, that you, it could be, sometimes it's like an hour, but sometimes it's like days, could be depending on what exactly you're doing, that you pop up and make sure that you, you, you start by pointing the ship in the right direction and then you have to confirm after rowing for a little while that, you're, that the horizon is still where you thought it was. Right? Yeah. So in terms of tools of the office, I think we use for communication, collaboration, Slack. Slack is a big one. So the whole company runs on Slack. The integrations are really great for us. Um, pager duty. We get pager duty alerts. We get uh, Stripe alerts. We get uh, there's a bunch more. GitHub stuff, obviously. GitHub stuff. Uh, oh, Intercom. We do all of our customer service through Intercom, which is Ember app. It's pretty awesome. Feels yeah. good. We actually use a lot of Ember apps, which yes. feels good. Yes, that is true. Feels really good. Um, which is good for communication, GitHub obviously for source control, and then for project management, we were using we kind of were uh, not really sure whether to file things as GitHub issues before. We also had a Trello board for organizing, so every Monday uh, we have a iteration planning meeting where we all kind of go around. And, oh, you know one thing that Leia started doing that's been really useful is just putting a grid of the days of the week on. On the, every, on the whiteboard every person on for the every team. person. And so that's been really helpful because it's it's hard to estimate without that kind of grid. And I've noticed it's really nice at the end of the week to go back and say, okay, you know, on Monday I was supposed to work on this, on Tuesday I was supposed to work on this, on Wednesday I was supposed to work on this. And then you can kind of see where the slippage started. If you're starting to slip behind or if you're ahead, you can see that you're ahead as well. And I think nice. Trello, we basically have uh, over time moved it to more and more high level. Um, and we've actually added a few, like more and more states um, not too many states, but like there's now we have a research step, which yeah. is basically which we got from the Heroku Postgres team, which is just things that everyone knows we need to work on, but we're not really quite sure yet how and people are sort of investigating it right. as they have time. I think we'd like to have a good plan going into the future so they don't yeah. kind of spin your wheels. Yeah, we've done a little bit of RFCs for more like the price, new pricing that we did a few months ago. We had like a yeah. really long RFC yeah. internal process. Uh, yeah. Term which sounds way more annoying than it Well, is. figuring out pricing is just a really hard thing. I think yeah. anyone that works at a small company startup that's tried to figure out pricing knows that it's like you're you're you want to try to fit that value price value curve, but it's, yeah. you're never going to hit it. On and I think making head. sure that just like people don't feel like because they weren't in the room at a particular time they lost track of the entire conversation and all of a sudden it went somewhere crazy. Yeah. So that, I think we used we have like we've only had like four or five RFCs. But they're all for cases where we want to make sure that everyone feels like they were actually participating when they wanted to and didn't feel like things went off the rail. You know, they took a day off and all of a sudden things went off the rails. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm trying to think. If there's a, I guess we kind of veered off from programming tools. These are more like day-to-day -day running the business tools. But I guess we spend as much time running a business now as we do actually programming. Yeah. Or I mean, obviously day. GitHub, I think, is probably yeah. like this. Ah, Travis, of course. So actually, mm, yeah. Travis is pretty awesome in the sense that you can kind of think of Travis as like a message bus for GitHub events. So obviously one thing that it does is it gives it like tells you whether the test passed or not. But you can also use it to like spin out other tasks. So like Ember does a lot of stuff. Rust. So in Ember when the build passes we upload the S3. Yeah, we it's all coordinated. Like the whole Travis. canary process. Ember app. Like the in Ember like when we when you submit a, an issue and it has a bug fix beta on it, the Travis build looks at that commit message mm -hmm. and says Okay, I know that we need to run the test on master and beta. And if both of them pass, then it cherry picks the commit into beta automatically, right? So the Robert Jackson special. Yes, it's Robert. <laughs> it's but badass. but like that's the kind of stuff. I think you could sort of think of it now as a mm -hmm. as a message bus. People are like, well, you know, Travis doesn't support browsers. Well, you could think of it as a thing that just uses browser stack or something like that. Right. As a as a it's it's a message bus. It says, okay, I want to test, and it uses browser stack, and then it uses, gets the results of browser stack to feed into more steps. I guess you know, speaking of tools that we use every day, Ember CLI is another one that I kind of take for granted. And Ember CLI actually hides the implementation detail of all these other tools. It does broccoli for us, does SAS for us, which we use pretty heavily. Yeah. Um, it does. Uh, yes, it's uh, modules. Module yes, testing, so testing. it wraps test them, so, which is actually really awesome. And Phantom JS. So my yeah. so my girlfriend got a job writing Ember apps, which is I'm still getting used to. <laughs> but she called me and she was like, "How I need to test across like multiple browsers. How do I set that up? 
And my immediate reaction, my Pavlovian response was like, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. But it took less than two minutes. It was literally just editing a JSON file in Ember CLI and then through test them. It just, it's like magic, man. Like all these browsers pop up in your docs. Like boom, 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 boom. Okay, it passes Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. It was pretty. Yes. I remember pretty... when it did not used to work. As well. Yes, no, it was quite, it was quite painful. I remember when Phantom JS first appeared. Like before Phantom JS, it was yeah. like, boy, it sure would be great if there was like a headless solution. And like everyone's, and it's like everyone says that. And then one day it appeared, it and then there. and then everyone who like started programming after that, it's like, oh, of course, Phantom Jets. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was kids. There was a time before <laughs> you could headlessly run JavaScript with DOM, and it was it was pretty painful. Yeah, and then uh, you know I really like Compass, SAS. These tools have made us extremely productive in terms yeah. of CSS. Like actually being able to write CSS yeah. with abstractions seems yeah. good. Actually, there is a, a gem. Uh, Zara, my girlfriend, recommended for doing responsive design called Breakpoint. And she was raving about it, and I was like, yeah, 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 it seems good. And then I finally went and ended up implementing responsive design, and it, it makes it really easy to define rules. Because usually you use media queries, and you're repeating the same rule yeah. over and over again. Yeah. This makes it, you can put a media query in a variable and reuse it really easily. That's sweet. All right. Seems good. Yeah.